I'm going to ask your headmistress if the school may have an extra day's holiday as a mark of my visit. Her name is Princess Margaret of England, and this is her biography. Wallace, this is Biography. Our story, Princess Margaret of England. According to a 600-year-old legend, any girl child born in Glamis Castle will be wed before she is 20. Princess Margaret was born in Scotland's Glamis Castle, but in her desire to live her own life, she would break this tradition and many others. Her spirit of independence earned her the respect and the affection of the British people. They came to call her England's royal rebel. Nineteen thirty five. The British Empire celebrates the Silver Jubilee, the twenty fifth year in the reign of King George V. On the balcony of Buckingham Palace. Three generations of the royal family are acclaimed by their subjects. The Prince of Wales is destined to become the next King of England. His younger brother, the Duke of York, remains in the background. There is very little chance that he or his children, Princess Elizabeth and Princess Margaret Rose, will ever become the ruling monarchs of England. Elfin Margaret Rose, born in 1930, is four years younger than her sister. She is unpredictable, mischievous. Anxious to be recognized as Elizabeth's equal, she goes out of her way to attract attention to herself. Elizabeth is patient, more reserved, but even now there exists a genuine affection between the two sisters. The British press nicknames them the Inseparables. From early childhood, Margaret Rose and Elizabeth are carefully screened from public view. They make appearances only on rare occasion. George V, Margaret's grandfather, dies. As she views the solemn funeral cortege, six-year-old Margaret Rose says, I'm sure God finds him useful. Margaret's uncle, David Windsor, Prince of Wales, will become King Edward VIII. The new king, however, is deeply in love with Wallace Simpson, a divorcee. To marry her would mean breaking the law of the Church of England. But rather than lose the woman he loves, Edward abdicates and goes into exile with his bride. To little Margaret Rose, it is a mystifying, frightening event. She will ask, are they going to cut off his head? Albert Frederick Arthur George is now become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, George the Sixth, King. The Duke of York must now assume the throne. As he is crowned King George the Sixth, 
seven-year-old daughter officially becomes Princess Margaret of England. Father, she says, just when I learned to write Margaret Rose of York. apparent to the throne, Elizabeth is groomed for her royal duties as the future queen. Margaret enjoys these public appearances. Though taught that a princess must be restrained, aloof, she cannot contain her curiosity and her youthful enthusiasm at official functions. She often becomes the center of attention. action during the evacuation of Dunkirk. At Balmoral Castle, where the royal princesses spend the early years of the war, Margaret is critical of the newly constructed defenses. I don't think much of your barbed wire, she will tell a high-ranking general. Elizabeth and I have been crawling under it all morning. In an England torn and tense from savage enemy air attack, the appearance of the two royal princesses is a great morale booster for the military and civilians alike. With their parents often called away on official visits, Margaret turns to Elizabeth for advice. As they grow up, Elizabeth serves more and more as a steadying influence on the high-spirited Margaret. Even in later years, she will make it a practice to telephone her older sister once a day, no matter where she is. 1946. Elizabeth is being courted by Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten. Margaret, at 16, begins to assume more and more official duties, bringing to them a warmth and informality which charms the English working people. For the first time, she feels a sense of personal freedom. that she is ready to choose a husband. She surrounds herself with a dozen or so men about London. They're called the Margaret clan. At a court ball, she even jokingly reprimands her sister. You go look after your empire, Margaret tells Elizabeth, and I'll look after myself. Comments a British officer, Think of having that much fun with everyone peering at you and with your parents in the position they are. No matter where she goes, no matter what she does, Margaret is front page news. In Capri, her vacation is marred when photographers with a long range lens invade the privacy of her bathing beach. She visits Christian Dior's Paris dress salon, where she chooses a strapless evening gown, an unconventional fashion for a member of the royal family. Margaret has an avid interest in the brightly lit world of show business. She is a great fan and friend of comedian Danny Kaye. The British press dub her Britain's number one playgirl. She is often compared to her uncle, David Windsor, and is even called a chip-off old David. February 1952. With a suddenness that stuns the British Empire, King George VI is dead.
loss of her father has a deep and sobering effect upon Margaret. She takes refuge in a heavy schedule of duties, in the preparations for the coming coronation of her sister. May 1953, Princess Elizabeth becomes Elizabeth II of England. solemnly promise and swear to govern the peoples according to their respective laws and customs. I solemnly promise so to do. to marry soon and step out of the spotlight of public attention. But she has become involved in a love affair which will not only make world headlines, it will be a dramatic and agonizing ordeal for her, for the royal family, and for the British Empire. Elizabeth completely absorbed in her duties. Princess Margaret is left more and more to herself. During the course of her court functions, she is attracted to a member of the royal household, group captain Peter Townsend, a dashing, enthusiastic gentleman jockey. Townsend was one of England's air heroes during the war, appointed by the late king as an equerry of honor. He has been stationed in Buckingham Palace since Margaret was 14. circles, there are rumors that Margaret has fallen in love with Townsend. But to the court, marriage would be inconceivable because Townsend has been once divorced. Realizing that she is flying in the face of British tradition, Margaret makes sure that she is never seen in public with Townsend. They arrange meetings which are carefully guarded from the English people and from the press. But a royal secret cannot be kept forever. 1953. English newspapers break the story that Margaret is in love and wishes to marry Peter Townsend. Margaret and the Queen Mother are leaving for a tour of southern Rhodesia. Queen Elizabeth immediately cancels plans for equerry Peter Townsend to accompany them. Townsend is ordered to Brussels as air attaché to the British Embassy. The affair becomes a matter of debate throughout England. Well, I feel that she's very much a private individual these days because she is so far removed from the crown after we have the queen and the two children, royal children, to come to the throne. And therefore, I think she should be treated now as a private individual. Quite frankly, uh, divorce today isn't what it was a few years ago. And uh, he was not the guilty party, if the term can be used. And uh, as far as she's concerned, she's obviously very much in love with him because she must have had opposition. And uh, there again, I and all my friends wish them all the luck in the world. Well, I married the man of my choice, and I'd like to think she could do the same. Well, the way I look at it is that uh, she really likes the fella. Let her, let her marry him. Well, I don't see if it makes any difference with one couple are happy. Well, I feel the same way. If she likes the chap, and. Say one for her, it's up to her, let her make her own mind up. Ah, oh, if the Queen herself, she was likely to be Queen, then I think it would be a rather different situation, but I think she should be left alone now to enjoy herself. Oh, that's my opinion of it. <coughs> I don't think there's anything else I can add to that. On her return, Margaret continues to carry out her official duty. Publicly, she gives no indication of the turmoil within the royal family. It is said that Philip strenuously opposes the match. The Queen, even if she would want to, cannot approve. Though she sympathizes with Margaret, as titular head of the Church of England, she must enforce the law which forbids any marriage to a divorced man whose wife is living. Her independence, her continuing desire to live her own life, 
have brought Margaret to the moment when she must make a difficult decision. She must either put aside her personal feelings by bowing to royal tradition, or marry Peter Townsend and become a royal exile like her uncle, David Windsor. October 12, 1954, Group Captain Peter Townsend returns to England. He and Margaret have been corresponding regularly, but this will be the showdown. The decision must be made. Margaret receives him for tea at Clarence House. When he leaves, a tight-lipped Townsend says to reporters, no comment. For almost three weeks, the press sets up a virtual state of siege around the royal residence. They trail every move made by Margaret and Townsend, even when they try to have a secret rendezvous at a country home. Tuesday, November 1st, 1954. All programs of the BBC radio and television stations are interrupted for this announcement. The following statement has just been issued from Clarence House by Her Royal Highness Princess Margaret. I would like it to be known that I have decided not to marry Group Captain Peter Townsend. Mindful of the Church's teaching that Christian marriage is indissoluble and conscious of my duty to the Commonwealth, I have resolved to put their consideration before any others. I have reached this decision entirely alone. And in so doing, I have been strengthened by the unfailing support and devotion of Group Captain Townsend. leaves England. That night, Princess Margaret accompanies Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip to the premiere of A Farewell to Arms. After 18 months of family crisis and intense emotional strain for Margaret, the Townsend affair is over. She looks like someone who has awakened from a nightmare, a close friend says. Her expression of relief is indescribable. As if to get away from her personal disappointments, Margaret leaves on a whirlwind tour through the Caribbean islands. There is great sympathy for the princess from the British public. They greet her with a new affection wherever she appears. here, she says prophetically, not as a princess, but just to enjoy myself. Gradually, quietly, Margaret steps out of the limelight. Her sister's firstborn captures the heart of the empire. He will be the next king of England and is known throughout the Commonwealth as Bonnie Prince Charles. Margaret whimsically remarks, Well, I guess that makes me Charlie's aunt. Even at more formal functions, she displays the same engaging sense of humor. the summer, a young society photographer, Anthony Armstrong Jones, is one of Princess Margaret's regular escorts. A friend, yes, but still a commoner, says a court advisor. He's certainly no match for the princess. Both the Queen and Prince Philip, however, have put their stamp of approval on Armstrong Jones. He comes from an old Welsh family. His father was a distinguished trial lawyer. 26, 1960. To the delight of the entire Commonwealth, 
the Queen Mother announces the betrothal of Princess Margaret to Antony Armstrong Jones. Though she could have had the pick of European nobility, Margaret has chosen to marry a commoner. London, May 6, 1960. Princess Margaret is 29. Today, she becomes the bride of Antony Armstrong Jones in a ceremony of pomp and majesty as old as England itself. this man to thy wedded husband to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honor, and keep him in sickness and in health so long as ye both shall live? I will. traditional for a royal bride. Perhaps they also feel a certain sense of loss, for apparently Princess Margaret has left behind her the youthful high spirits that had endeared her to them as their royal rebel. As a princess of England, Margaret is expected to accept without protest the endless demands of royal duties. Occasionally, however, she is bridled at the dictates of protocol. She is too much an individual to be totally ruled by court conventions. As she herself once said, I don't want to be anybody else but the person I am. Mike Wallace for Biography.